Come, Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle within us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, O Lord, that we may be recreated, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Amen. Okay, good morning and welcome once again to the Cardinal Kelvin Felix Archdiocesan Pastoral Center located at East Winds in Maricel. Today is the fourth time that we are gathering here to listen to another lecture in the inaugural Father Reginald John Lecture Series. I am McCorville Combi, the host of the lecture series. I am also the program officer here at the Cardinal Kelvin Felix Archdiocesan Pastoral Center, which is responsible for the coordination of this lecture series. Today's lecture, the fourth in the series, is entitled Poverty Reduction Strategies in St. Lucia, and it will be presented by Dr. Ezra Shabatis. For those of you joining us for the first time, in the first two lectures, we became acquainted, or in some instances, reacquainted with Father Reginald John, who he was and his pastoral ministry. In the third lecture, the Eucharist and the poor, we learned how partaking in the Eucharist is the acceptance of the responsibility to assist the widow, orphan, and the poor. Today, we move on from reflections about poverty and the reasons as to why we have a responsibility for the poor and dispossessed among us, to what are the, some of the things which have been and are being done to address this issue. And to provide us with this information is Dr. Ezra Jabatis. However, before he does so, I would like to invite director of the Pastoral Center Deacon David Purpo to provide us with some bio biographical information on Dr. Ezra Jabatis and following that to invite him to make his presentation. I thank you, Doc Deacon Purpo. Thank you very much, Mark, for the introduction, introductory remarks with respect to the Cardinal Kelvin Felix Pastoral Center. And good morning, um, friends from the Care Institute, which, as we know, started with Brother Dominic many years ago. And through the Catholic Church, we are very grateful that um, your teachers, you know, and yourself have continued um, your education, so that is extremely important. So we, we welcome you. Let me just, before we ask Dr. Ezra Jabatis to make his presentation, to give a bio, a brief bio. Dr. Ezra Jabatis is a highly knowledgeable and experienced human and social development practitioner who holds a doctor of philosophy in social policy, and he also holds a master's degree in social policy and planning, as well as a bachelor's degree in sociology, education, and history, and a postgraduate diploma in matters related to population and development studies. Dr. Jabatis has over 25 years experience in development planning, planning for development, and the implementation processes at the national and regional levels. So he also possesses um, experience in small island developing states such as St. Lucia, Grenada, Dominica, and the other Caribbean states that we are familiar with within the OECS member states. And part of his educational and professional experience includes doing surveys, socioeconomic surveys. So when, as young people, you go across on the, the Millennium Highway and you see 
or, or throughout the length and breadth of St. Lucia, and you see persons taking surveys as to how it's going to affect um, the populations, whether it be on the highways or the towns and villages. You know, like this morning, when you were coming up, for example, we saw what happened on the bridge. Um, but that does, doesn't happen overnight. There has to be some level of a survey. And Dr. Ezra Jabatis has, over the years, been involved in just one type of socioeconomic survey and many others. In addition, um, looking at poverty assessment, qualitative poverty assessment, um, undertaking baseline assessments for what we call the environment, environmental and social impact assessments. Um, and he will explain that. But basically, you know, um, you, you, all of us as students know in terms of the impact of climate change, you know, and the impact of climate change, which has um, indications for flooding. We see how a little rain, a little rain that comes into St. Lucia, remember Thomas and those things, and we get flooded, you know, not just St. Lucia, but throughout the rest of the Caribbean islands. The evaluation of planned regularization of rural housing development, preparation of poverty reduction action plans for governments, and also as well, the completion of these reports. He has demonstrated competence in participatory consultations, you know, ensuring that, that persons participate in whatever the government of the day or whatever sector attempts to be involved in the development of people. Um, focus group discussions, transact walks, and also as well using a gender and social approach with respect to ensuring that there's full participation of all genders. He has also conducted training in the capability approach and design training of trainers program as part of applying ideas and concepts aligned to what is called the multi-dimensional poverty um, approach to poverty analysis. A brief about Dr. Jabatis' work history. He was the project manager, the Sir Arthur Lewis College Transformation Project during the period 2010 to 2011. He was the employed at the OECS Commission, or what was then called the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, located at the Mon, as the social development specialist and became head of the social policy unit and program manager experiences between 2005 and 2009. He has also had a professional working experience of the government of St. Lucia and was the deputy permanent secretary, acting permanent secretary between the period 2002 and 2005 at the Ministry of Health, Human Services, Family Affairs and Gender Relations, and the Ministry of Social Transformation, Culture, and Local Government in St. Lucia. He also served as the Deputy Director in the Development Cooperation and Program Planning Section between 2000 and 2002 at the Ministry of Planning, Development, Environment, and housing. He also served as the chief social planner between 1994 and 1997 and was the social planning officer between 1991 and 1994 in the Ministry of Planning, Personnel Establishment and Training. Dr. Jabadis also was a lecturer at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College during the period 1986 to 1991. He has served as well as a consultant, as a social policy and development consultant, and has undertaken consultancy projects funded by the government of St. Lucia, the Caribbean Development Bank, the United, the United Development Program, and the World Bank. So what I have 
giving you here is just a snapshot of the professional contributions, the educational background of Dr. Jabatis. And of course, against that background, I want to ensure you that as we come to listen to our fourth lecture on how we in St. Lucia, or for that matter, across the Caribbean, can work together as young persons, um, as adults, as students, you know, to really work towards the reduction of poverty within our native St. Lucia. And who knows, some of you will be traveling, you know, overseas at some point. Um, it may become part of your college or university program in terms of poverty reduction, you know. And also as well, it will serve you well with respect to um, your own academic background and studies at, Cape, at the CAPE program. So let us join me in welcoming to the podium for this lecture, Dr. Ezra Zabatis to make his presentation. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to thank Mr. Popo and Mr. Combi for introducing me to this session. And I must tell you that any discussion on poverty can never be short. There is so much to talk about. And of course, I know that there are some, we have some time limitations. We'll try our best to see if we can cover as much as we can this morning. But particularly, I would like to say a few words regarding the invited guests, in particular, the students from CARE. I don't know if they recognize me, but are you current students of CARE or past students? current students, and I've had the opportunity to be with them on a few occasions to share some information on job preparation and things of that nature. So I'm very happy to see them here today, and I'm hoping that by the time they leave here, they would have had a better understanding of the plight of poverty in St. Lucia. So without any further ado, I just want to indicate that the program for today, the agenda, is a long one, but we'll try our best to see if we can, you know, make it brief. So basically, it's the aim of the lecture, what's the status of sustainable development in the country? We must look at some definitions and concepts so that we can better understand what the, po what the poverty situation is. And of course, to give you some idea of the figures, how many poor, how many non-poor, and so on. And then we go straight into the particular types of programs that are being undertaken right now to try to reduce poverty. Then there are some other programs, not necessarily calculated around social protection, but there are other things happening in other ministries, in other state organizations, in other community groups that do contribute to poverty reduction. So we do some of that as well. And then we want to try to zero in on the role of the church. What exactly can the church do? Given the current situation, given what is planned by government and other groups, where can the church find its niche? What are the entry points for the church? And then I offer some recommendations and then we have a discussion. But if as I go along, there is something that you don't quite understand, you can stop because I want you to understand what I'm saying. So this is the aim of the lecture, to provide an overview of the various strategies, programs, and that are currently in place that seek to enhance the quality of life. In other words, 
What is it that exists right now? What is being planned by other groups and agencies? And then to offer some insights on how the church can contribute to improvement in the quality of life of poor people, indigent people, vulnerable people, deprived people, but not only people, but households, which are, you know, comprised of people, of course, and communities. Because I'm sure you'll be able to tell me, based on what you observe, that this community seems to be better off in terms of its infrastructure, housing, drainage, and so on, than community X or community Y. We do have those kinds of contrasts in the country. So we're not only focusing on people, but we're talking about collectives of people in households, as well as collectives of individuals in communities and the surroundings that they live in. Uh, this map here is just for information. It just, if you look at the shaded areas, the darkest area there, it, it speaks to where poverty is very high. The lighter areas where it is very low. So if you know St. Lucia, the area that's shaded, that's shaded in, the, in the dark here would be where cast trees and some of the environments. Okay, but don't focus too much on this one. I'm going to, you, you, you'll get copies, right, of the presentation. So let's look at concepts. What is poverty? It's a lot of things. It's denial of choices and opportunities. It is a situation where we violate the human dignity. It means also lack of basic capacity to participate. And by capacity, we mean education, skills, competencies, and so on. You don't have enough. The individual or the household does not have enough to feed or clothe the family. Doesn't go to school. Doesn't go to the clinic. Doesn't have land on which to go food. Doesn't have a job. Doesn't have access to credit. Insecure. The person is powerless. They're excluded from individuals to participate in the society. They're susceptible to violence and crime. And of course, they live in very fragile environments. And by fragile environments, we mean environments where the place floods easily. There are landslips. There's a risk of landslide and so on. There's no access to clean water. And most of all, in some cases, there is no way they can go to get support, or there's nothing in place that they can access to get support. And this is what we mean by the safety net. Okay, that's one definition. But then you have another kind of poverty, which is not just money poverty. In the context of St. Lucia, you can describe poverty as having a certain amount of money in order to buy your basic needs, to go to the health center, to go to the health clinic, and so on. But it's more than that. It is multidimensional, meaning there are several dimensions to the situation. And again, it's repeated at the bottom there. It's, it, it comes back to what we talked about. Hunger and malnutrition, ill health, lack of education. So quite apart from not having enough money to buy the goods and the services that you need, there are other things. Homelessness, inadequate housing, social discrimination, lack of participation in making decisions that will affect you, not being able to participate in civil and the social cultural life of the country. So it is more than one dimension, not just money. And there is indigence, things really hard for that individual. They don't have enough of the basic amount that is necessary for them to survive. And deprivation, they don't have it. Things that are considered necessary, they don't have. They're deprived. Sometimes of their own making, sometimes of the, because of the system. And then there are those who are vulnerable. They are in a situation where anything can happen and they can fall into poverty. They can become deprived. They can become indigent. For instance, you live on a, some, a lot of families and households live on the slopes. 
And then you hear the storm. It's full of rain, full of water. The house falls down. They lose everything. That household was vulnerable to poverty because they found themselves in a situation after the flooding or after the hurricane, which made them instantly poor. They were doing well. I mean, you know, they could go to school and they have the resources and, you know, they have the little backyard farming taking going on. But because of that risk that came on as a result of the hurricane, all of a sudden, a household of 20 people or 15 or 10 have nowhere to live. That is vulnerability. So all of us may be vulnerable to poverty, but some of us can do better than others, and therefore we can take care of the risk, ensure that we have good shutters in the house, ensure that the foundation is strong, but not everybody in the society can do that, so they are vulnerable. And what happens sometimes? There's a situation called poverty duration. It just continues. I know some of my co colleagues here would remember the words of George Beckford, persistent poverty. It just doesn't go away because some families don't have the means, some households don't have the means, and therefore they experience persistent poverty. And George Beckford was right. At the time he was criticized, but now is vindicated. So what's the situation like? What's the incidence of poverty? How much poverty is there? How much multidimensional and so on? And that's what we mean by incidence, okay? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Okay. I will try not to use all of these big words, okay? <laughs> but there's something called the Sustainable Development Goals. You've heard about that? 17 goals that have been established by the United Nations and which countries have said we will try our best to achieve those goals by the year 2030. This is called a dashboard. Can you put up the lights a little bit so we can get a little more? The arrows there tell you what's happening and what is not happening. All the arrows that are going this way, right, that's better, says to you that something is happening. The arrows going up to the right column says moderate improvement. And this one we're talking about life on land, talking about forests and trees and so on. But the main point about this is that whatever you see in the if you look at the bottom, you see two green marks. A green arrow going this way and a square. The square means they have, the country has achieved all of the sustainable goals. Do you see any green marks there? There are no green marks. The upward green arrow says on track on maintaining SDG achievement. Do you see any green marks going there? Therefore, it means that St. Lucia is still struggling to meet those sustainable development goals. We have made improvements in some areas, but this is just an overall assessment, okay? So we are still striving to achieve. And there are lots of things that have been done and a lot more things that still need to be done. So we'll find out what's going on. Remember I told you about multidimensional poverty? Not just money poverty, not just the fact that you don't have you know, the correct amount. But there are people in the society who are multidimensional poor. And according to the information, 21.4% of the people of the country. There are those who are vulnerable because they don't have enough to spend to buy the things that they need. 3.6%. There are those who are also vulnerable because they are deprived of social needs, education, health, housing, psychological support, and so on. However, 
11.1% are not in any of those categories. They're well off. They're okay. And we will see in a while to what extent are those individuals trying to assist those who are poor and vulnerable and deprived. So this is just a snapshot, okay, of the situation. There are more people who have multi there are more people who are vulnerable than those who are poor. In other words, you are poor, fine. But they ask, there's a lot more people who are in a situation where they can become poor if certain things happen. And that's what we mean by vulnerable. Okay. And if you look at poverty and vulnerability by gender, that is male, female, and according to households and individuals, based on the information we have there, females are more vulnerable. Males are in more, more females are in poverty than males. On the male side, in the population, 46% of males are considered poor. On the female side, 54%. So who's experiencing more poverty? Males or females? Males. And this, this is what we want to look at to see how we can address that. So what have been the trends? What, what really is happening? Remember there was COVID? In the time of COVID, we had poverty in the range of 25% because there was a decrease. However, we also see a decrease from 25% to 19% in 2019. So there has been a decline in poverty. However, it takes a certain amount of resources to decrease poverty more. And that is what the term poverty gap means. Don't worry too much about it. It just says to you, the country will need 7.5% more resources in order to be able to maintain low poverty. So the, the poverty um, increased to some extent, not only among individuals or decreased among some, but from, the, from a district point of view. And the next map shows you that the Denu district Forget about this one. This one is not really important right now. This is the one we're talking about. Maps. Right. Look at the one on the, what's that, right or left? Right. The one with more orange colors. This is 2006. And the darker colors means that there was poverty ranging between 40% and 60%. The lighter orange, poverty between 20 and 40%. The lightest color, poverty in the range of zero to 20. Well, you don't have zero, but it's just for statistical purposes, you say zero. Compare that to the other one. Which district has now become the poorest of all? The darkest orange, which is Denry. Look at Denry in 2006. It was okay between 20 and 40, but in 2016, things were bad. By the time it was measured in 2016, things were bad. So Denry, in the, situ in the case of Denry, the poverty increased. 2023, we don't have all the figures at this point in time, but according to the information that we get from the World Bank and from other places, there's, there's supposed to be some decrease in poverty, especially post-COVID. But that we'll see in a while. What are people deprived of in St. Lucia? See the longest line at above, at the top? This is health insurance coverage. And according to the information, 
92.5% of people living in St. Lucia do not have health insurance coverage. Do you know what that means? It means that if they fall sick, they can't get returns, they can't get you know, support. Homeowner insurance on dwelling unit. 64.3% of people living in St. Lucia who own homes do not have insurance. Access to internet, 57%. Now that's 2016, eh? Things may have changed by now, but this is just the raw data. Chronic disease, 46% of our people. Access to health facility, 30%. Never mind, we have all of those wellness centers and so on, but there is a significant proportion of our people who still do not have access for various reasons. And those people will include persons with disability, persons who don't have the money, don't have the transportation, don't have the support, and therefore it is difficult for them to access. It is not that the facilities are not there. The facilities are there, but it's accessing the facilities. And you go down the road, you go, you go down the line, okay? Secondary school attainment, secondary school attainment. We still have a situation where 20% of persons of secondary school age do not attain secondary school attainment, do not, um, do not attain secondary qualifications, sorry. Other long-term employment, 18.2%. So this, is, this graph gives you a situation of where people are in terms of what they're deprived of, okay? Children are very, it's very important to look at children. There's a reduction in, in, port, in the number of poor children from 2006 to 2016, reduction of 25%. And as a result of that, the child poverty rate fell from 34% Sorry, from 36% to 34%. Poverty among children is higher in the rural areas. The multidimensional index, meaning where they look at poverty plus other things, there is no big difference between adults and children. They're saying this, the rate is the same. But there is a serious situation of poverty when it comes to children. Agree? You agree to that? You're not listening. Hmm? COVID-19. What did COVID-19 do? It reduced the gains. You notice a while ago, you know, there was increased hair, decreased there, and so on. But COVID came in, and it did a lot of damage. So you know about the tourism story where there was, you know, reduction in tourism and also persons who used to send money abroad, you, all right? Your aunts and uncles and friends used to send what is called remittances, money. And you'd go and get that money at one of the, the money outlets. But that amount decreased by about 60%. Annually, St. Lucia gets about 2.8 million. So if you, read, if you do the mathematics, half of that is 1.4 and take away another 10%. A lot of the money that used to come from overseas decreased. And that's what is called income shock. You know when you don't work, you experience a shock in income. You know what that means? Either you don't get any more income because of your, the situation, or you get less. You know when you get a shock, what happens to you? When you get a shock, what happens? Okay? You feel it, and you respond to it. However, the impact on women was more or greater than on men. And of course, there was a lot of unemployment among the youth, among the elderly children, and so on. During COVID, high food insecurity. A lot of these households experience food shocks. You have income shock and you have food shock, which means, what does that mean? It means that you're eating less food than you used to eat before or you don't have enough. So what did they do? A lot of households had to reduce their consumption. Some of them had to go back and squeeze, take up a little bit, on, take up as much as possible, 
on the savings. And in some cases, it was so bad that a few members of the household, especially poor households, starved. There was food starvation in St. Lucia at some point. A lot of us don't know that because we look around and we see everybody's okay, but we don't know what's happening inside the household. But when the survey was done in 2021, it was found that there were a lot of households where a number of persons starved. Starved meaning they did not have the correct amount of food or the right type of food. Starvation doesn't mean that you don't have food, you know. It means that there are certain things about food that you could not get at the time. It's not the same as famine, it's different, okay? So there was hunger. There was starvation. Not enough money coming into the household. More people, in some cases, became poorer than before. But the government did some things. You know, governments already respond to the situation. And one of them was to provide support. They had what is called a stimulus program. It really was a fiscal measure for those who understand the economics of the whole thing because they wanted to protect jobs, protect the vulnerable, provide some relief. You know, if there's an income shock in the household, you will be glad to get some relief, not so? Provided grants, they deferred tax payments. So the idea was to help people recover at the time. Okay. And these are some of the things that were done. You know, they expanded the public assistance program from 2,600 households to 3,000. There's an error there. Okay, they provided top-ups, cash top-ups to many households. I'm sure you remember advertisements on the radio, go and fill out the form, bring it in, etc. Some got to 500, some got a 1,000, some wanted more, you know? So these are some of the things that happened to try to alleviate the problem brought in by COVID. I mean, talk about, you know, the gender. Some of, the, some of the, 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 the literature coming out of the research post-COVID suggests that a lot of the measures that were in place for COVID benefited men more than women. Yes? You have a question, sir? You understand what I'm saying? You with me? Okay. So, quite apart from the government, there were other persons or agencies who responded to the COVID-19 situation. Churches, religious organizations, credit unions, civil society organizations, community-based organizations, the private sector, statutory bodies like NIC, the diaspora, your friends from overseas, your relatives, your cousins, philanthropists, those persons who feel where they can give generously, give $1,000, give you know, some food baskets and so on. And there's the social capital. Your friend, your neighbor used to give you a little something, right? They shared with you. There was networking. Well, let me go by so-and-so because he or she is my friend. And I can get something. You know, we've had a good relationship. And neighbors used to, you know, act nicely between them, among themselves. But COVID did something a little more. In other words, it exposed some weaknesses in some of the government responses. And that is where the whole idea of the social protection comes in. First of all, well, it, a fragmented system means that not everything worked, you know, nicely together. They realized that the amount of spending for vulnerable people was too low, not enough. The coverage was still limited. And there's lack of coordination. You know when there's lack of coordination, what happens? This one is doing this, there's duplication here, and so on. So a few lessons. So then what are some of these current strategies from a social protection point of view that, would, that, would, that, would take, that, that took place? You have to have a commitment. And of course, we talked about the sustainable development goals. And one of the key goals is to reduce poverty. 
by 2030. Then you have the, the government has its own development strategy or plan. And in there, you do have some programs that have been identified for implementation to help the situation. And there are a number of approaches. Do we go like we did before? No, not necessarily. Let's change the approach. So we talk about life cycle. Life cycle means that we look at the population in various age groups, zero to four, five to nine, and people like you, 15 to 19, you are part of the life cycle called 15 to 19. Anybody there 19 years? 18, 16, right. So you are part of that group called the life cycle group. This is just a little picture just to give you some idea of what is in the government's plan, okay? Environment, social transformation, health and wellness, building capacity, strong institutions because you must have strong agencies that can deliver for people, infrastructure, connectivity, and so on. So that is just what the government has laid out. And of course, there are things that crisscross one another. Gender, social protection, you look at women, disaster, risk reduction and management, because if you don't take care of the drains and the culverts and, the, and so forth, people become at risk, those who are living in steep gradients, and they are at risk if they're living in the valleys for flooding. So disaster risk is one thing that can create poverty because of vulnerability. So these are just some of the ideas. But in St. Lucia, we have what is called targeted programs. In other words, they identify certain groups and categories of people in order to try to alleviate the situation. And there's a reason for that because you really want to focus on the poor. You want to focus on persons who are living below what is called the poverty line. In other words, a certain amount of money that you can have in order to spend for you to eat and survive. The focus is on multidimensional because you don't only want to pay attention to creating jobs for people, but you want to help them in other ways. And then the, the, one of the most important reasons is to reduce child poverty. Child poverty is a big problem in St. Lucia. So what do we have? There are systems that people must make contributions to for them to get benefits from. And I'm sure you know about NIC, right? NIC is one mechanism where contributions are made to the agency so that other persons can benefit. And there's only one institution in St. Lucia that does that, public institution, and that's the National Insurance Corporation. How do they get the money? They take it from the salaries of people, whether you're private sector or public sector. So payroll taxes. You know, a long time ago, you could, get, you could pay a tax and the government takes off whatever. Now it is paid to the NIC. But there's some informal ones where people make contributions just to say, have you heard about the Friendly Society? My time in David's time, there's a particular group of individuals who met at the Anglican school every Monday Every, every month, the first Monday of the month, and I had to go and contribute my mother's $2. Society. You come and at the end of the year, if you are a faithful contributor, you get a little bonus. You get $20, $25, okay? The Friendly Society Initiative. That's dying now, but then, you know, this is actually legislated, you know. It's in the legislation of the government. 
Okay, a few still exist, I think, but I'm not sure where they exist. But this was a popular means of contributing to a fund so that you can benefit from it for sickness and for, most of it was for burial. Okay, so at the end of the day, you don't have to scratch your head too hard if you are a faithful contributor. And my mother was one, so I used to go and collect. And you pay a levy every time somebody dies, you have to pay a levy, a little extra more than what you contribute. So if the, if the payment was $2 for the month, the levy would be 50 cents. So you pay 250. It was called, it was, you know, contributory. The susu, you know about the susu? That was another informal arrangement. Okay? You can be in a susu that says the contribution is 500, there are 12 persons, and when your turn comes, you get 12 by 5, 6,000 or 5,000, whatever, because you, your contribution is already there. And there's credit, credit unions, you know, you contribute to the credit unions, and you can go in there and ask for a small grant, a small loan. Okay, so these are contributory mechanisms. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on that one, but then there are advantages and disadvantages of several contributory mechanisms. The NIC, for example, which is public social in um, insurance, it doesn't favor the poor. That's not for poor people. That's for persons who are employed and who can work. But because of the situation, there's a big, there's a, there's a big gap. There are a lot of people in the society who are not covered by public, by public um, insurance. So the government has considered introducing what is called unemployment insurance. Now, unemployment insurance means that the government would be willing to pay persons who are unemployed a certain amount. But that is a very costly exercise. And therefore, it is something which is being discussed within the government circles. That kind of, that kind of contributory mechanism is you know, good for, it exists in developed countries where they have the, you know, they have the fiscal um, resources to be able to do that. But this is one thing about the NIC. It does not accommodate everybody. And there are some persons who are not always able to contribute on a regular basis. And they cannot benefit. I think the law is that you have to contribute at least six months to qualify for certain types of benefits. So that the individual who is in the informal sector, you know, working on the side, the vendor, okay, who is making a contribution, because you can't do that on your own, you can walk into the NIC and say, I am employed as a vendor and I would like to contribute to the NIC because there are certain benefits I want to get, like, take advantage of. You can do that. But those persons in situations like that do not always have sustainable employment. So they work for two months and they contribute. When you do that, when they do so, it's not possible for you to get any benefits. I think there is a, they, they, they're giving consideration to that kind of situation, but this is one of the drawbacks, okay? So this is a public sector. So contributory, there are some challenges, and like I said, not enough contributions puts you outside of the range of benefits, okay? Okay, let's go to the next slide. There are lots of factors affecting contributions, Minimum wage, you're laid off, you're suspended from work, and so it's not possible to contribute. That's basically what this slide is saying. Redistributive. Government has mechanisms in place where payroll taxes can be redistributed to those who require assistance. All of the resources that we have for the redistributive programs come from payroll taxes. Persons who work and who pay tax, or pay the NIC. So what do you have? Social assistance. You have the public assistance program. You have the Kudmes at DC, the child disability. These are some of the main ones. Then social assistance in the form of in-kind. The first one has to do with money. Contributions of, okay? This one has to do with in-kind. 
and from the public sector point of view, school feeding program. Then you have social care services. All of the all of the, the institutions that take care of the elderly, the young, persons with disability, and so on. And then you have the active labor market, where you can go, learn a skill, become competent in something, learn, get, get a CVQ, and you can find your way into employment. So the public assistance program is, is on, but the coverage is still low. However, that program is not oriented to the multidimensional approach. It only deals with money. There are some plans that are being considered where there might be a need to incorporate other dimensions. But at the moment, it is a contribution to the household in the form of money. Like I said, the coverage is very low, and therefore it means that only 1% of the, of the population is covered, especially in the, in the northern region. And look at the age ranges. There are about just under 50% 50, 50 of the beneficiaries in the age group 18 to 64. And a lot of them have been on the program for a long time. We talk about graduation in a while. Some people have been on the program for 20 years. And the question is, why is it this there for so long? There are lots of reasons. All right, we'll skip this one, demand and supply. That's true. That's right. But what, what the program does sometimes is that because some people stay on it for so long, it creates new categories of poor. So just imagine the lady who is 40 years. She's 40 years old, and she has been on the program for 20 years. She's now 60 years old. She's had two children of her own, but her, but her children have now had more children in the same household. So it creates a new category of poor. So now you, do, you don't just have this lady as, as poor, you have the grandchildren, and knowing the situation sometimes where cousins and other people move in, that household creates a new set of poor people. They have not moved out of the cycle. Okay? So sometimes because they become more vulnerable, you have more disability, new illnesses like COVID, come on. And so while the program is excellent, there is a situation where it facilitates a higher contribution to poverty. And recommendations have been made that this program be looked at again and perhaps combine it with another program which we'll talk about shortly. Could Mr. at least see? You heard about that? All right, it's, it's, it's one of the programs that tries to address multidimensional poverty. And there are seven pillars. Personal identification, health, education, family dynamics, housing, and so on. There are a lot of persons in St. Lucia who do not have a birth certificate. And that program was intended to do that. Now, if you don't have a birth certificate, what does that mean? You can't send a child to school. There are families in St. Lucia whose children don't have a birth certificate. They cannot claim rights. They can't go and say, well, this is what, I mean, they can't get passports. They can't get health cards. You must have a birth certificate. Something that says who you are, when you were born, where you live, etc. Formalize. Health is straightforward. Education is straightforward. Family dynamics, there are families that are dysfunctional. They don't work well. There's a lot of aggression. There's a lot of hate. Emotional trauma. And so that program was intended to address that. And for the housing, of course, we know the situation. A lot of our families and households live in dilapidated conditions. And so under the SSDF, there was a program for housing. Employment, in most cases, the employment here was basically to give, provide basic training. And income, 
This is the part of the coolness that you see that represented the PAP or the public assistance program. So anytime you were on the Kudme program, you were more than likely to receive public assistance from the public assistance program. But that did not last very long. And so there are, there are some plans to revive it. But one of the things it did, you know, there's always good things about those things, right? One of the good things is that it allowed or enabled some people to move from what you call geographies of poverty and vulnerability. That is in this situation. To geographies of opportunity and empowerment. So they built capacity. There were some changes in their lives. But there was an agreement. Under the KSL, you had to agree for a two-year period to be under the program. And the intention was for you to move out or what they call graduate. But not many people were able to graduate because they did not fulfill some of the requirements. So they stayed on. And unfortunately, the last one was in 2020. And it's a program that's been looked at once more. And a lot of people are very much keen on ensuring that the program is reinstated. Active labor, market, active labor market programs are programs that try to help unemployed people. Okay? Sometimes they provide cash. I'm sure you've heard of situations where training has been provided, but they also give you a stipend. Huh? So that's what, that's what the cash is all about. Job placements, it helps with training, job creation. The objective is to enhance the employability or to provide job opportunities so that people can enter, at least provide an entry point into the labor market. A little analysis shows that there is a lot of duplication in some of the services. There's overlap. And some of the agencies that provide the training and the support, a lot of them are doing the same thing. So there's a need to introduce new programs. You know about the school feeding program? The aim is to reduce malnutrition. And that program is ongoing in schools, uh, especially in the preschool area. It covers 79 of the 81 schools, 70, of the 70 of, out of 74 public schools. However, uh, it has been noted that nutrition among children is very high. However, um, a lot of poor people, a lot of poor children benefit. About 59% of poor children between the ages of 5 to 11 benefit from the program. It is what is called a flagship program of the government. So were it not for the school feeding program, can you imagine what would have happened to those children coming from poor households, and they still, they still do, you know. It is the job of the teachers now to identify the signs. You have a class of 25, you should be able to notice that because that child is not paying attention, it might be a situation where the child hasn't had a breakfast. Some children come to go to school without anything. No lunch, no lunch kit, no bag. So that program is very, very critical. And of course, there are some gaps that need to be filled. So it could be an area where the church could get involved. We have a, a situation of the, the Child Disability Grant, where the government provides a certain amount of money for persons if households, if children or persons who are disabled. However, during the COVID period, the government decided to increase the amount from 200 to 300 and to increase the number of persons from 2,600 to 3,600. So there was, some, there was some expansion, okay? A horizontal expansion means that you get more people involved. A vertical expansion means that you increase the amount that you give to the persons with disability. Social care is one area that requires a lot of attention. And I'm sure you will agree with me that 
sex, child sexual abuse is one of those. Girls between the ages of 12 and 16, 70% of the cases coming from these from that group of persons is sexual abuse. You know, I've heard, I'm sure you've heard the practice of washma. You know what washma means? The child says, he molested me. The mother says, Savwe? She says, oh, that's okay, that's true. Okay, well, I'm not going to take you to the police anymore. Just give me $5,000. That's Wajma. In other words, they're compensating the person because the mother doesn't want to take the case to the police. And a lot of that still happens. There's no law against it. There is concern. But there's no law. A study done in, in 2016, I think, showed that 70% of children experience corporal punishment and that and the, the, the parents of those children, a lot of them, agreed that's the best method of, of disciplining the child. Severe punishment methods still exist, and there is no law against it. There's condemnation from various circles, but the legal parameters are not there. And this is a big gap. Shelters for victims of, this, of domestic violence is a challenge. From the knowledge and information I have, there's one domestic violence shelter in St. Lucia that can accommodate just a few people. And so something needs to be done about that. Child labor is a problem. Sometimes you don't hear about it, it happens. Sometimes it is, you know, pushed under the carpet, under the table. But there's commercial sexual exploitation. I know you know the stories of the girls, some of the girls down at the bus stop. What do they do? Sex for rides, for clothing, for cell phone. Sometimes parents encourage it because they are in situations of financial need. So local and foreign children, not only nationals of St. Lucia, sex trafficking. There's violence in schools, bullying, gang-related gang incidences. And when children are exposed to those things, there is a high tendency that they stay away from school. We have the situation of missing children. Missing children, children just go missing. I'm sure you've heard of the recent situations. All of those situations demand a lot of attention. And of course, to reduce the incidence of those things. There's a, there's a high demand for care interventions. A lot of it is provided by the state, some of it by private individuals, some by the Catholic Church, some by SSDF, but there is a great demand for care, very high demand for care. We have now come to the end of part one of the lecture, Poverty Reduction Strategies in St. Lucia. We look forward to you joining us for part two.